Welcome back and alive now from Fox. I'm Austin Westfall. The Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General has opened an investigation into the Secret Service's handling of the security for former President Trump's rally that was held in Pennsylvania that resulted in an assassination attempt over the weekend. The agency says the objective of the probe is to evaluate the Secret Service's process for securing the campaign event, and it joins a long list of ongoing cases that the Inspector General's office is already pursuing. President Biden had already directed an independent review of the security at the rally. Lots of questions do remain surrounding how the 20-year-old shooter managed to climb on top of a building and open fire. National security analyst Hal Kempfer joins us to break this down. As always, Hal, thanks for coming on and helping us understand some of what we've been hearing. And there has been a lot coming out. I'm going to start with this from Jackie Heinrich. Senators held a half-hour conference call Wednesday with Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle and FBI Director Christopher Wray. And some new information did come from that meeting. Fox has learned that the senators were told that the shooter wrote on the gaming platform Steam that, quote, July 13th will be my premiere. Watch as it unfolds, unquote. When investigators further reviewed the laptop, they found a few searches in July of Trump, Biden, when is DNC convention, and July 13th, Trump rally. Okay, so we're finally starting to hear a little bit about that digital footprint that you and I have been talking so much about, Hal. What do you make of the latest developments? Uh, Austin, I wasn't surprised. In fact, the, that they went to a gaming platform, I think they're going to find more there. I think we're going to hear more about that. Uh, you may recall Jack Teixeira, that airman that uh, who released all that classified information, just a a horrible breach of national security. Well, he was very active on a gaming platform. And of course, gaming platforms are extremely popular, very, very popular with teens, people in their early 20s, that uh, that's where they spend a lot of time. It's where they socialize, it's where they communicate. And it may be, as they dig into this, uh, where we find the connections or maybe the motivation, if you will, that led him to do whatever he was doing. Uh, clearly, more is coming out that he was a very troubled individual. He had a lot of problems, um, you know, emotional problems, uh, among other things. But that doesn't normally drive someone to do something quite this heinous. Usually, there's something else, and usually, it's there's there's others who are kind of ramping them up in this direction. So the gaming platform thing, I think, was absolutely crucial uh, in in finding that he was bragging about doing something. And I'm thinking there was probably some other communication that, that went back to him that may have been part of what got him to that point. So we're finding out more about that. So uh, some more reporting that came out of that meeting earlier today. The New York Post reports that 10 minutes before Trump took the stage, the Secret Service was warned about the shooter and designated him as a threat. The Post also says that the agency was warned that there was a character of suspicion on the grounds more than an hour before the shooting. Hal, you're no stranger to security operations like this. When you try to put yourself in the officer's shoes that day, what could possibly lead to the type of behavior we're talking about here? Behavior that, to many Americans, seems so careless. Well, there's, a, there's obviously a failure in on-site threat assessment, if you will. Uh, there were those who saw stuff and they immediately identified as suspicious, or as identified him as suspicious, they saw activity, they identified as suspicious, but there's a command and control problem that took place on site. If you look at the timeline, that, I, I, there are reports out that they had identified him as acting suspiciously and were looking for him for about an hour before this thing. And they lost sight of him, didn't know where he was. Obviously he was maneuvering around trying to do stuff, but he actually walked up to the magnetometers and he had a range finder. It's not a weapon, but a range finder is something that you use to figure out, as it sounds, the range. It's something that a sniper or a shooter would use to figure out range. They thought that was very strange. They uh, uh, reportedly, they had pictures and then he disappeared. And then he eventually made his way up to that roof, got up there, and the first time they spotted him, apparently he had the range finder in his hand. And if you're doing long rifle shooting, that's probably because you're adjusting uh, your weapon, your sights, or your optics uh, for the particular range you're going to be shooting on. Now, if you look at how the shot itself, uh, it was a 
fairly precise shot. I've, I watched slow motion of, of, of Donald Trump's head turning. And, and frankly, that was just pure luck that he happened to turn his head ever so slightly right before the round went off and it clipped, you know, grazed his ear. If he had been turned, if he was where he was just a split second before, that round would have gone, you know, basically into the back of his skull. So he he basically, uh, you know, he it was it was something where even if he was a poor shot, and of course there's rumors and or there's stories that when he was in high school couldn't make the shooting team all that. All of that aside, there was a uh, that was one of those things where he was actually very well prepared for employing that type of a weapon and what he was doing. Uh, but it is absolutely, you know, I, you look at the timeline, you go, why didn't they get, and I've, I've been to major events where something comes up in the crowd, there's something suspicious, and they'll take the performer or they'll take the uh, whoever it is on stage, and they will say, one second, we're trying to resolve something, and they will take them off the podium, put them someplace uh, off to the side until the danger or whatever it is subsides. There's a lot of questions as, why didn't the Secret Service do that? Why didn't they notify him there was a suspicious individual out there? Why didn't they take normal precautions one would take, certainly with a musical act or something like that, if there was even something like that going, why didn't they do that? It's very confusing. I think there may have been some communications problems with the radios, but of course, you know, the big problem they have is uh, that that building was essentially unsecured. There was, it, the, the law enforcement was supposed to be there, weren't there, and he got up on the roof. Does it appear to you that shortcuts were taken that day? You know, that was my sense. My, my Look, when you're running a big event like that, uh, working security for it, you got a lot of things going on. There, there you know, you have, um, you know, various different layers of stuff. My sense is there was a, a planning problem, a coordination problem, and a supervision problem. It's one thing to hand off a, a zone to another law enforcement agency. In this case, they did to the local Butler uh, Police Department. Butler Police Department, as I understand it, has 12 total officers, that's it. Butler Police Department, before the event started, said, look, we don't have enough officers to cover that building. They told Secret Service that, Secret Service knew it, and Secret Service uh, didn't do anything. And, and here's the reality uh, of a lot of these things. When you find these failures, after they get through doing the forensics on this event, somebody, maybe DHS, Office of Inspector General, needs to go back and look at previous events. I, I, I am skeptical that this was a one-off. I think what happened was they had been taking shortcuts at previous events and getting away with it. And, and when it comes to security or, or, or it comes to emergency preparedness across the board, but certainly with security, shortcuts and security work until they suddenly don't. You know, you can get away with it for a while, eventually someone discovers the gap in your security posture and they exploit it. And then all of a sudden in a very dramatic fashion, everything you did failed. And that's what the Secret Service is dealing with now. And, and it, it would kind of make me want to look at everything the Secret Service is protecting at this point. I would probably, when I get done with all this, if I was inspecting this or investigating this, I would start looking at the White House. I'd start looking at Camp David. I'd be looking everywhere. I'd be looking at the procedures around Air Force One for that matter, because this was a glaring gap. And it tells me there's a command and control, there's a planning problem, there's a coordination problem with outside agencies going on with Secret Service that they need to address. I know you've been following this Iran situation. Uh, Iran has rejected accusations regarding plots to assassinate former President Trump, the state-run IRNA news agency reported on Wednesday. The news came out yesterday that a threat on Trump's life from Iran prompted additional security in the days before Saturday's campaign rally, but it was unrelated to the assassination attempt. Hal, your takeaways from the Iran angle to this? Uh, you know, I don't see a direct connection yet uh, that I can figure out. Uh, I think you know, it will be interesting uh, to see what what they what comes of this. This isn't really. This is new, but it's not new. Obviously, the story broke about this specific threat with Iran and uh, and, and former President Trump uh, literally Tuesday morning. I think it was when it broke. Uh, and and so everybody was tracking this. Although, if you want to go back to uh, earlier in June, 
there was a 60 Minutes uh, segment that talked about not only the, the threat against President Trump, but all of his cabinet members, the fact that they're under 24-7 security, uh, you know, long after they've left office because, uh, you know, Iran wants to get even for the, uh, you know, the basically the assassination of uh, General Soleimani, the uh, head of the IRGC, the Al-Quds force that took place in Iraq, and that was on President Trump's orders. So uh, it wasn't really a shock that this was that there was an Iranian threat out there. That, that Iran denies this, um, you know, I, I I would say I'm I'm skeptical of anything the Iranians say. And if they deny it, then it's probably a safe bet that they that, that it is absolutely true. And I think the it. shock that most people get from this, Hal, is they read that headline and they 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 it kind of compounds on what we've already been talking about, which is shouldn't there have been extra security measures in place at an event of this type, given that there was some sort of threat involved in the days before this actually happened. And and actually, there have been some who looked at it, and it does look like they beefed up his security detail. He actually had more. The question there is, why? Why did you have this huge gap? And I think there's a command and control problem with what they were doing on site. Now, it, it sounds to me, I haven't heard anything that said that when they did the advance team went up there and did their plan, that they left uh, this wide open. What it sounds is, is things were moving along and all of a sudden local law enforcement, this is a rural area, local law enforcement says, hey, we can't cover that building. We don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough uh, uh, officers. We don't have, uh, you know, I think they were planning on putting a car there as well. We just don't have enough resources in order to do that. Then the Secret Service have, should have adjusted the plan, but that takes a dynamic sort of command and control thing. That's when they need to be looking at this in a very different fashion. And I I don't want to say they've been winging it, but I think they've been uh, kind of getting through these things and they've been uh, leaving little gaps and hoping, you know, hoping nothing happens. Uh, in this case, certainly with the, the threat of Iran, which I don't think was, that didn't sound like it was new. Sounds like they knew it. I don't know if they fully assessed that, but they knew it was there. I would have thought they'd have a, a, a you know far more robust capability to cover those gaps, and obviously they didn't. Four days have now passed, Hal. What lingering questions do you have about Saturday? Uh, big questions I have Saturday are um, what happened uh, in the communications? What did they know, and when did they know it? And I'd like to know who was in charge on site, all right? Who was in charge of the setup? Who was in charge during the entire... Uh, I'm going to call it an operation during the entire event. Who was there uh, doing this? Who? What were they communicating? What training were they providing with local law enforcement? And one thing, uh, with local law enforcement comes back and says, hey, look, we don't have the resources to cover this thing the way you have in your plan. That kind of makes me wonder if that didn't get taken into uh, consideration in terms of what they were doing, what other things were not being done? And I'm kind of wondering... Was there any training afforded local law enforcement on how to work with Secret Service or how to better cover these areas in situations like this? And I'm kind of getting a sense that maybe there were shortcuts in that area too. I'd like to find that out. I'm hoping that uh, we're gonna learn more. I think we're gonna learn, uh, I, DHS OIG, uh, I, I'm, I've never been terribly impressed with their process overall. They seem to be rather slow and they miss things. The FBI, though, I think will get in there and take a much harder look at this. And I'm, I'm thinking that the FBI is going to show a lot. I also think that uh, when they actually, you know, they just subpoenaed uh, the direct, director Cheadle of the Secret Service, among others, uh, to Congress. I think they're supposed to testify Monday. I think we're going to hear a lot from that hearing. I think we're going to hear a lot of uh, accusatory language in a congressional hearing. That seems to go without even mentioning it. But I think we're also going to find out some information uh, certainly from the top leaders as to what's going on. And I'm hoping at this time, the Secret Service can provide a more more comprehensive picture of, of what was going on, but also what went wrong. All right, Hal, we'll leave it there for now. As always, we appreciate your insight. Take care.